Yeah, g'day. It's Shane Dowling here from the website kangaroocourtofaustralia.com. Now, I'm with uh, Sirka and Ozturk from the website True Crime News Weekly. And we're going to be talking about the Bruce Lerman defamation trial. Uh, both of us have got uh, articles that have been submitted as evidence. There are exhibits in the evidence and also on the federal court website. The federal court website uh, publish all the documents or most of the documents in uh, public interest matters. And so our articles are on the website. So we're going to discuss that and we'll d- discuss other issues in relation to the trial. But firstly, uh, Sirkan, you, you want to talk about how you came about writing an article, like you were the first one to name him, and that's why your articles have been submitted as evidence. Um, I think on the 15th of February, 2021, Samantha Maiden wrote an article in the News Corp website uh, about the alleged rape, but didn't name Bruce Lerman. And that night, uh, Channel 10 on the project, Lisa Wilkinson did an interview with Brittany Higgins. They discussed the alleged rape, but once again, they didn't name Bruce Lerman. But on the 17th of February 2021, two days later, you wrote an article naming him. So you want to give us a background to that article? Yes, Shane. But firstly, thanks for having me on your program uh, for the first time. A long time a fan, as you know. Um, but the Bruce Lerman case, as you know, a lot of people are talking about it this week with a defamation case. And yes, uh, both of us have been brought up in the courtroom um, and a bit of explosive um, cross-examination by the Channel 10 barrister, Dr. Matthew Collins, KC. Um, but yes, it, it goes all the way back to 2021 when, um, as Shane highlighted, the timeline there with Sam Maven breaking the story, then Lisa Wilkinson's project interview, which is the only one that's being um under the quash for defamation now uh, um, out of all the articles. Um, but I came into this uh, this production of um, corruption, um, can I say, um, of, uh, by uh, naming Bruce Lerman on February 17, um, 2021. Um, and the reasons why I got involved, um, I've already made this public, um, we didn't identify Bruce Lerman from Lisa Wilkinson's project interview. Um, it was, uh, as a journalist, I, I did not know who he was just by watching that, um, that interview on the project. So just personally speaking, I find it bizarre that he's, um, suing that, uh, reasonable people could identify him from just that program. Um, but what ha- happened was obviously there was a lot of internet chatter after the, um, events of, of the project and the Sam Maiden, um, uh, News, News Corp article. And a lot of people were trying to guess who this person was because it was anonymous at the stage and about four or five different people were being named online on Facebook and Twitter. And I had a quick look into who some of these people were and straight away I could tell at least three of them weren't involved just by going the timelines of their resumes and where they were and who they were at. And, but these people were being named publicly. Some had young children as well. Um, And I, I thought it's probably best that I look into who actually did this. And if I can name them correctly, get that name out there quickly into the public domain because the wrong people were being named. And I thought that was wrong. Um, Sources came to us um, separately from the project interview, had nothing to do with that, um, who told us that um, in parliament, everyone who's everyone who's anyone who's been a long time worker knew it was Bruce Lerman because his name's been an open secret about these matters for since 2019. And so we ended up publishing his name. He then um, checked himself into a mental health hospital um, and uh, all all the Liberal Party helped him do that. And that's why we're involved, I guess. And so, yeah, we're now in 2023, towards the end of 2023, and we've got this defamation trial of the century type stuff happening. Um, And interestingly enough, Shane, both of us are going to go down in Australian political media and legal history because this defamation trial will be studied for a long, long, long time. Yeah, I suppose uh, suppose you're right there. Just quickly, now, don't want you to name your sources, of course, but did your sources say it was an open secret that Bruce Lemon was alleged rapist uh, on both sides of politics? Labor knew, Liberal knew, Greens? It seemed to be that there was knowledge of what had gone on amongst a wide array of politicians and their staffers. As I've mentioned to a, a judge in another case um, unrelated to this, uh, politicians and their staffers and journalists are the world's biggest gossips. So as soon as this got out to one person, it spread like hellfire through Canberra. And so this whole 
fact that his reputation's been ruined by the media is also ludicrous when hundreds, if not thousands of people knew Bruce Lerman had done something allegedly dodgy, um, including rape. Um, and that's why he'd been skedaddled out of parliament. This was kind of open common knowledge amongst the Canberra elite, if you if you if you will. So the bottom line is that once the article in the News Corp ran that morning, I think Bruce Lerman said he read that article at eight o'clock in the morning on the 15th of February 2021. Um, and other person gave evidence. She was reading it before nine o'clock. She was at school assembly. So once that article broke, even if the Channel 10 uh, story never went ahead, it was almost certain that you were probably going to write an article anyhow and name him. Would that be correct? Do you think? Yeah, because there was so much internet chatter just about who this person, who could do this in the halls of Parliament House and take advantage of a young woman, you know, in the early hours and do it so like brazenly and and so there was so much chatter that, yeah, because I was running True Crime News Weekly as a publisher and writing regular stories about crime, corruption, politics. So, of course, we're going to look into it. And it was the right thing to do at the time. We, do, we stand by uh, journalism 100%. And nothing that's come out of the defamation case um, has proven our journalism wrong. Like if you read the, art, the original article, which uh, Mr. Lerman and his uh, legal team have complained about, um, and you read it with a, a passage of time and with hindsight, everything we've said in that article is even more true today. Um, you can read it for yourselves. It's as, you, as Shane has said, it's on the federal court exhibit um, page. It's, uh, it's openly accessible for everyone to read. It's also on our website, True Crime News Weekly. Um, so yeah, we were going to get involved in some way. Um, did I know that this was going to be such a wide ranging cover up for someone who seems quite inconsequential? I didn't know that this would go on and on and on and have people like, you know, your mate Kerry Stokes involved funding Bruce Lerman, uh, dodgy lawyers, left, right, centre trying to get a piece of the action. I, I didn't know it would become such a soap opera. But then I, when we looked into it further and further, we realised that's because um, people have directed the criminal cover-up, have been accessories after the crime, have perverted the course of justice. And we're talking about senior politicians here up to Scott Morrison. They've had to use uh, the Secret Services or AFP to delete CCTV footage from Parliament. So there's a whole range of people who's involved in Bruce Lerman's cover-up. And that's what that's what this defamation trial is really about, trying to stop the public really knowing who else did what criminally. And so this is to shut up the, the public in that manner, but also to put a kibosh on all the other women who've been sexually assaulted in federal Parliament. Uh, we know that there's at least seven alleged rapists um, in Parliament House. But Peter Dutton covering up at least 30 to 40 sexual assaults in Parliament over the last few years as well while I was Home Affairs Minister. Home Affairs Minister um, Peter Dutton at the time covered up the Bruce Lerman um, incident. Mm -hmm. And so this defamation case is it's a theatre for the cover-up. But the lies are so obvious now that it's imploding. And so that's why we've seen the absurdity of the last week or two um, with Lerman especially on the stand, just telling lie after lie after lie and physical evidence showing him to be proven wrong. And uh, it's sad that this wasn't the criminal case. It's sad the criminal case was um, uh, stuffed up by a, a, a dodgy juror who we don't know what was their motivation. Uh, who knows who set this juror up? Um, there's so, so many questions about this case. And at least this defamation uh, battle uh, the, the lawyers for Channel 10 and Lisa Wilkinson's lawyer, Sue Chrysanthu, have done their homework, have read like all the journalism, they've read your website, they've read my website, they've gone all over Twitter and Facebook, and they've put a few of these dots together. They, they In the defamation case, they did ask Bruce Lerman about his links to ASIO twice, and both times he kind of clamped up during the questioning from Dr. Collins. And so there's all this stuff in the background, Shane, that they're trying to keep uh, the public from not quite understanding. But but back back to the defamation case, when uh, Bruce Lemon gave evidence in March this year when he was uh, seeking an extension of time, at that time he was actually suing Samantha Maiden and Channel Ten uh, and News Corp as well. And ABC. And so he gave, gave evidence. No, it wasn't ABC at that time. Okay. I think after that he, he added ABC. So at that time it was uh, Lisa. I mean uh, Samantha Maiden and News Corp. 
and he blamed them. He said he identified himself from that article. But because he settled with them, he's backpedaled from that when he gave evidence last few days, last week. He's backpedaled from that because that doesn't suit the claim. He's now saying, no, he didn't identify himself <laughs> from that article. He only identified himself from the Lisa Wilkinson uh, project interview on Channel 10. So he's contradicted his own evidence to suit the scenario, which has changed, where he's uh, settled yep. with Channel 10, and his credibility has gone down the drain. So it's interesting. Uh, I think that's worth noting. Now, we'll move on to – we'll skim through a couple of articles. Um, that was on the 17th. You did your article, and I'll put the your link to your article below this video on YouTube so people can click on it. Then he's public, uh, he submitted three articles from me. I wrote yes. an article on February the 19th, Scott Morrison refuses to deny alleged Parliament House rapists is Bruce Lerman, uh, who previously worked in Senator Reynolds' office. Now, that article was not much more than me sending an email to Scott Morrison's office asking them to confirm or deny what you have uh, had written a couple of days beforehand. And they refused to do that. But I think that's newsworthy because Scott Morrison had an obligation. Uh, like you said, there was numerous names floating around. He had an obligation to really say whether it was him or not. Uh, he obviously refused to do so. Then on the 23rd, I just wrote an article. It's not was well, it didn't add a lot, but it was worth adding that I came across a media release showing that Bruce Lerman did work in her office at that time. Then on the 27th, and I know you have a little bit more information in relation to this, I wrote an article and I researched it a bit. Uh, and the title of the article is Were Young Women Sexually Assaulted When Bruce Lerman, the alleged Parliament House Rapist, was an official at uh, ANU UN conference. Now, they brought in new rules. They wrote about it, uh, str stringent rules a year after he was involved about uh, sexual harassment and that, which implied they had problems a year before when he was involved. <laughs> And yes. no one said anything. Now, I remember you saying you heard information about his time at university at ANU. But for people who don't know, Australian National University is in Canberra, and Bruce Lerman studied there for a while. Then there was these rumours and allegations which Shane published regarding the ANU, um, a university conference which ANU was involved in. Um, people got in touch um, with me who went to ANU after your article, Shane, and they uh, they they corroborated the same, uh, these um, uh, these suggestions that you highlighted in your article by saying that Mr. Lerma was part of a group of young men who kind of were known to um, uh, kind of be misogynistic and um, uh, make women feel unsafe. And so there was already uh, that was known about him at university. And then we've got the stories of him after university. So he's gone through university. There's been an issue which has been highlighted to the point that they've actually had to change the rules for this um, uh, conference they hold every year, thanks to Bruce Lerman's actions, alleged actions. And he's then gone to Parliament House as the rising star. And then we've got, these are in the corporate media reports of, you know, um, News Limited, even ABC, that he's, there's five, three to four women, Liberal Party staffers who've had similar incidents uh, as to Brittany Higgins, allegedly. And so there seems to be a pattern of behaviour here. And has he been protected or is it just because there's a boys club and they all do the same type of stuff? Um, uh, yeah, there's so there's like a lot of question marks about is it's not just about Brittany Higgins. Um, that's that's what I want the public to kind of understand, Shane. They're trying to be like carry Stokes and News Corp now trying to make it Brittany Higgins versus Bruce Lerman. But there's a bit much, a bit more to that, um, to all of this. I just want to talk about the fact that Justice Michael Lee, who's hearing the matter, threatened to uh, potentially close down the broadcast, the YouTube broadcast, so the public couldn't watch. And the reason for that was that uh, there was a complaint or a couple of complaints in relation to some of the people who were tweeting various information, criticising the barrister representing Bruce Lemon, who's Steve Wybrow. And Justice Lee never specifically identified the person, but it was suspected it was you uh, because you were the one, uh, I think, calling uh, Steve Wybrow a piece mm -hmm. of shit or whatever. Um, and someone later uh, implied it was me. Some troll was saying, oh, we should block 
and not follow uh, Sir Khan and Shane Dowling because they're going to get the broadcast uh, cut off, the live stream cut off. Now, obviously, that didn't happen. Your comments, while someone on, on the face of it might think it's over the top and too severe, from a legal viewpoint, it's protected. There's high court judgments. Uh, Longy versus ABC, and specifically one called Coleman versus Power, where the person called a Queensland police officer, dirty, sleazy, slimy, corrupt bastard, or words to those effects. And there's another one. Uh, I'm sure I'm pretty sure you know the person, uh, and I'll look it up. Where is it? Danny Lim, who called yes. Tony Abbott C U N T. Yes. Now, so. What you said about Steve Wybrow, some people might be offended by it, but it's well within the confines of the legal protection out there. It doesn't, it, some people think it pushed the boundary. Well, it didn't even really come any anywhere near the boundary, given Danny Lim calling uh, Tony Abbott a CUNT. <laughs> so, and I think where there might have been an issue is that uh, some of uh, Justice Lee's staff who raised it, they're the ones monitoring it, uh, probably fairly inexperienced because I've commented uh, live on uh, the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption. Anyone who followed that live would have seen uh, the former New South Wales Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, and uh, John Barillaro copying an absolute hiding on social media while they were broadcast live and no one said anything because it's political communication. Yes. You're entitled to your opinion. You're entitled to call them names if you don't like them. Now, getting back to this court case, well, people argue, well, that's a barrister uh, in a civil court case. But it's not really a civil court case. It's really a rape case. And it's the most political court case I've ever come across, given where the alleged rape happened, given that two senators uh, um, gave evidence at the trial, numerous yep. uh, political staffers gave evidence, even uh, Parliament Health staffers, the security guard gave evidence. So because of all that, it's one of the most political cases ever. Then you got the fact that uh, they had an inquiry in the ACT where there were allegations <laughs> of a police cover-up. So you had the allegation of a police cover-up, political interference, uh, a political cover-up, and then the inquiry itself became a cover-up and blew you, you wide open. Walter Sofranoff. Walter Sofranoff. He's under investigation for potential criminal charges. So the whole, and that's got a court case to go forward uh, in February next year, where Shane Drumgold is instituting proceedings to have at least part. Originally, I think he was going to have the asking for the whole uh, judgment, to, whole findings to be quashed. But now I think he's only asking for part of it to be quashed, the parts relevant to him. So you have a look at all that, and it's political all over the shop. And that gets back to you and your comments. And people might say, well, he's not a member of the, uh, public service. So you shouldn't be attacking Steve Wybrow. But Steve Wybrow made himself part of the proceedings by going to the media and attacking yes. Brittany Higgins. Once he yes. did that, he's part of the whole overall uh, picture. And so you can't ignore what he's said and done. And I just want to, I'll get your take. I just want to read this out before I get your take on it all. Um, this is from the Spotlight Programme couple uh, months ago where Steve Wybrow was on it and he said this in a, he did at least an eight minute interview and I think he was in other parts as well and he said it's like the fix was in from the start in relation to the court case this is after the Walter Sofnov handed down his findings and then he says later the fix was in then he says later I still act for him in other proceedings so he didn't want to say whether he thought Bruce Lemon was guilty or innocent so he's saying all this while he's still mindful he's acting for Bruce Lerman and other proceedings, which is a defamation case. Um, so he's saying all that, which in effect defames Brittany Higgins because it implies that she made a false complaint to the police. She committed yes. a criminal offence by making a false complaint. And I believe he was doing all that to help soften her up for these proceedings. But by doing all that, he becomes open for criticism as much as anyone else. So how about we get your take on uh, what you said, uh, people complaining that you might get the uh, live stream cut off, et cetera? Yeah, so Steve Weibrow, as you have mentioned, to me is more than fair game here because he's done numerous interviews with News Corp that go far beyond just representing a client and even video interviews where he's gone, oh, the Me Too movement has gone too far and 
this too many f- fake accusations are getting up in court with with uh, no evidentiary backing up backing this up these claims these are just completely false claims and these were he's put himself into the whole theater um of as you said the cover up here this wide ranging cover up um with his own um previous public comments of misogyny into the public domain and as such his motivations are are, are worthy of public critique here and uh, Bruce Lerman um, and the spotlight interview Bruce Lerman did with his lawyer there that you're mentioning the Channel Seven lawyer, uh, the Channel Seven interview. Uh, his lawyer managed to get him 130, uh, 100, 100 to one hundred thirty thousand dollars free rent up to till June twenty twenty four. Um, that from Kerry Stokes, thanks to that interview and their their lies uh, on that in that interview, which have been played throughout the defamation case. In, in, in moments here and there where Bruce Lerman's been tripped up on the lies he said in that spotlight interview, um, which you'd have to wonder, remember Bruce Lerman in that um, interview said, my lawyers have my lawyers have said, suggested I don't do this and uh, I, 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 but I've not taken their advice and now I'm doing this interview. Then why is his lawyer appearing part of the program? Uh, if his lawyer was such against this idea of him doing these interviews on Channel 7 before the case, There's, this is whole been a set up by the lawyers from day one. They're not like these innocent, oh, uh, uh, he's just my client. They're really involved in this for some, as you said, some political reason. He, Mr. Weibrow is a true believer, if you so will, in this cover up. Um, he's a true believer in thinking. There needs to be more misogyny. There needs to be uh, the patriarchy needs to get their back against these uh, feminists or whatever they're angry about. Um, and so he's fair game. And his motivations and his uh, links to all these people uh, will become more clearer, I guess, as time goes on and uh, the defamation case has run its course. Um, but the words I said were kind of, uh, I called him a mis- misogynistic piece of shit. Um, without it, and I, you know, covered the, the swear word a bit. And so the funny thing was, by Friday afternoon, more people, more people would come to my side chain because he, he he continued on with his silly misogynistic attacks on Brittany Higgins on the stand, and more and more people would realize that what I was saying was probably well tempered. And so by Friday, um, more people in the public had seen uh, what Mr. Wybrow was doing for themselves more clearly, and uh, they were disgusted by it too. And then. It's interesting that the judge, uh, Michael Lee, um, was threatening to cut the live stream uh, based on social media comments when just a few days previously, people were calling Sue Chrysanthu rude, mean, aggressive, pushy, bitchy, blah, blah, this, blah, blah, that. But because she's a female barrister, did Michael Lee, the judge there didn't say, oh, social media comments against this barrister stop being so mean i'm gonna cut off the live link he only did it when there was a mean comment about a mean comment about this male barrister and so this this whole case has highlighted as he said the politics of it all but also the privilege of the justice system the legal industry um and uh, the kind of antiquated attitudes um that that are held and that need to kind of be highlighted so we can move to a, a better future where there's more justice for victims and survivors. I just want to say two things there, and I want to reinforce what you just said, one point, which I'd thought about, but then you said it, and that during the spotlight proceedings, Bruce Lerman, I think he was asked, said, yeah, yeah, my lawyers advised me not to do this interview. But then he's got his barrister in the interview. (laughs) So it's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But, But I wanted to get back to one point there to be fair and balanced. I think uh, in relation to uh, Justice Lee threatening to pull the live stream is more from inexperience on his side because not every case they hear is political. So if they're doing a normal equities case and that, uh, say, Westpac versus ANZ or whatever, you'll start abusing the barristers. Well, then they probably got grounds to cut the live stream. But because this is so political, and the reason when you say the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption, they don't even complain or say boo, is because all their cases, all their live streams are political because that's all they investigate is politics, uh, government corruption. And so they know and understand that. Uh, If you want to realise where it was bad is when um, former Premier Gladys Berejiklian was in the stand. Everyone was just letting rip. 
Yeah. And made you look like an amateur when we're like, you That's know, right. to criticism in a tax. St. Gladys of corruption, God bless her soul. Yeah, so, and John Barillaro, he copped it, and also the other politicians. So I want to put that on the record. Now, before we go, I just wanted to talk about the allegations of lies, the lies that Bruce Lerman has told, and he's admitted to many of them, and the lies that Brittany Higgins has told, and she's admitted to them as well. So, but I think the key here is that the lies that Brittany Higgins has told, and she's admitted to telling, uh, immaterial to the actual rape. You know, whether she was wearing underpants and how many times she washed her dress or if she didn't wash it or whether she wore it again, totally immaterial to the alleged rape. What is important here is what happened on that night, why they went back to Parliament House, what happened at Parliament House. And that's where Bruce Lerman's in a lot of trouble because his key lies uh, his three different alibis of why he went back to Parliament House and what he did there. Firstly, he said he was going back to pick up documents for uh, Senator Linda Reynolds. He told that to security. Then he told the chief of staff, Fiona Brown, that he went back there to drink alcohol, his whiskey. And then he told the police he went back to um, what was it, get his keys, and then he decided to do some work. Now, because he changed uh, his evidence at different times, and he's admitted to lying to deceive the people about the true reason why he went back to Parliament House. That's a big difference. If you're admitting to lying to deliberately deceive people, and he's admitted to trying to deliberately deceive them, big difference to lying to cover up whether you're wearing underpants because you're embarrassed, that sort of thing. Um, so that's a huge difference there, and that's why Brittany Higgins' lies are pretty well just white lies, and are totally irrelevant to whether he's guilty or not, whereas Bruce Lerman's are material lies that will determine, well, well, well it will be up to the judge to determine uh, whether those lies are material to whether he uh, committed the alleged rape or not. That's how I look at it. Where, how do you look at it? I'm very much on your side of this, Shane. A lot of, so if you look at Bruce Lerman's lies, he's told lies about this incident from very soon after it to his direct supervisors, to a minister. Um, he's told lies in his AFP interview, which we've got recordings and transcripts of. He's told lies in the actual defamation case one day after another, having to admit, oh, yeah, I told a lie just yesterday. Why did you tell that lie, Mr. Lerman? Uh, I don't, I can't recall. Um, so <laughs> it's it's been a bit of a pantomime, uh, really, um, with his lies. And with Brittany Higgins, a lot of those lies tend to be the confusion of trauma. She's trying to recollect this extremely traumatic event when she's been allegedly raped while extremely drunk, uh, thanks to Bruce Lerman, um, just going by the videos of that um, doc bar, um, just his uh, awful, awful manner of pretend. He, he lied about it too. Remember, he said he had no interest in Brittany Higgins um, in, in, during his first uh, comments during the defamation trial when his barrister was asking about things. I wasn't interested in Brittany Higgins at all. We bet we didn't talk at the night. Then there's video of him looking over his shoulder, buying her drink after drink, making her drink drinks. And so that he's, as you mentioned, the physical evidence of the night has completely contradicted him. And there's nothing of that sort towards Brittany Higgins. A lot of her lies are confusions related to trauma. And we know how, um, uh, PTSD or um, great trauma works now on the brain is you do lose focus of time. Like she claimed originally that she had a three hour panic attack. She probably did have a panic attack, but it probably it was 10 minutes, but it felt like three hours. And because you lose a whole sense of time and understanding. And so Mr. Lerman's lawyers are then trying to trip her up as a liar for getting confused about a panic attack. That actually gives her more credibility to her story because that's how a panic attack works. You don't take notice of the time. And so I hope this case has highlighted some, um, as I said, the antiquated legal industry, and it will hopefully push things forward a bit more uh, for other survivors of sexual assault trying to seek justice uh, through the legal industry. And so with the lies told, I, I personally am quite comfortable in knowing who the more credible uh, witness is. And that's, clearly Brittany Higgins. Um, Bruce Lerman, I would never see as a credible person um, because, as I said, he's told lies not just to one type of person or to one element of society. 
He's told lies and major lies and then contradicted himself in further lies to pe people like his bosses, political staffers, police officers, ministers, the judge, other lawyers, his own lawyer. Uh, I've lost count of who he's told lies to and for what reasons now. And so um, on this, uh, if people are bringing up Brittany Higgins' lies, I, I don't even bother really um, getting into arguments with these people because anyone who's watched this defamation case, forget about the two years previously and the two years before that when the rape actually happened in 2019, just watching this defamation case carefully over the last week or two, you will see um, who the more credible people are. And I think, Shane, uh, the public is noticing that this has been much more of a cover-up than they probably originally thought as well. Yep. So we'll get going there. We've only got a minute left before it cuts out. And uh, so thank you for your time. Now, do you have a PayPal or anything if people want to donate uh or...? Uh, at the moment, um, not really, Shane. I'm not really doing this. I'm, I'm probably going to retire from journalism. We'll just see what happens. Uh, I'll, I don't really want to promote anything. I don't do this for money or no, that's anything right, like man. that. And, and I don't really need um, um, the stress of um, you know asking people for donations at the moment. But, yeah, right. keep tuned. We may bring back some True Crime News Weekly journalism, whether it's for True Crime News Weekly or somewhere else. That, that, that That's for the future. But um, we'll be watching the Bruce Lerman case until the very end. Thank you for your time. All right, then. Okay, thank you. And thank you for watching the podcast slash interview there with Sirkin. I'll try and do more in the future. And I'll finish off this video like I finish off all my videos. Uh, Kangaroo Court of Australia's independent media, publish a website and a YouTube channel. And I'm 100% crowdfunded from viewers like yourself. So please support my Patreon account. I currently have 341 patrons donating $2,377 a month. And I need to almost double that to become financially viable. And you can donate any amount, $3, 5 10 15 20 30 40 $50 a month, whatever suits your budget. And the link for the Patreon account is below this video on YouTube and also on my website. And please share this video on social media. Other than that, thank you for your time and have a good day.